presentation. I was just about to say we're being recorded and uh, it's available later and Shruti is now going to take away the, the presentation. Thanks Shruti. Um, thanks very much, Simon, for the um, kind introduction and uh, welcome everybody. And um, again, as ever, we always actually begin with a big thank you. Um, thanks for joining this webinar. Hope this is actually a learning experience. And also thank you for all the contributions, ongoing contributions and valuable contributions towards um, patient safety as well as hemovigilance activities. And over the course of the next few minutes, what we would be covering is providing a bit of the background about the transfusions and transplants, specifically what are the challenges being actually faced and what are the pinch points that we can actually see coming through the um, short reports, as well as uh, uh, end it with the few key take home messages. And it's also important to actually clarify, none of us on the panel are actually transplant experts. However, we are actually speaking from a hemovigilance perspective and looking at the safe systems that need to be in place to ensure safe transfusions and avoiding the errors and making it as robust as possible. And as always, it is safety that is at the uh, heart of everything that we do, ensuring that it is actually safe for the patients and safe for the donors, as well as safe for all the staff as well um, as part of the process. And that is what we will apply to the hemopoietic stem cell transplant here. Now, all of you would be familiar by what the hemopoietic stem cell transplant means. Hemopoietic is anything that is actually resulting in the production of a blood cell. Stem cells, we know that these are progenitor cells and they have the ability to divide and multiply. So they can renew, they can also differentiate. Now, um, this is the hemopoietic stem cell transplant, which is also abbreviated as HSCT, is actually a therapeutic option for many malignant as well as non-malignant conditions, both in adults as well as in um, children. Now, based on where the stem cells are sourced from, whether it is actually acquired from the donor itself, that would be autologous or auto HSCT, or whether you're getting it from another donor, which is actually allogeneic stem cell transplant, which is also referred to as allo HSCT. And when you're talking about um, allogeneic stem cell transplant, it can either be from a related donor, which is a related sibling donor or a haploidentical, or it could be unrelated, and you can also have a cord transplant. So this is actually a huge variety of the sources that we can actually have. Equally, there are different terminologies depending on the intensity of the conditioning regimen that is used, as well as the sources of the stem cells, whether you're getting it from a bone marrow or whether it is actually from a peripherally collected um, stem cells or whether it is a cord blood, you can see different terminologies being applied to the types of the transplants. Now, to give a perspective of how many transplants actually happen in the UK, this is actually um, slightly older data. This is from 2019, but this was what was available on the BSB MTCT website. This is the British Society of Bone Marrow Transplant and Cellular Therapy. I've given the link there. And the number of the transplants are increasing year on year. And uh, the total transplants were around 4,580. Now, as you can see, more than 90% of them were first transplants. And there are some indications or some cases where you may have to go down the route of a repeat transplant. Majority of the donors in these transplants were unrelated donors. However, there were also lots of the sibling donors and pediatric transplants were actually seen in 404 and they were largely counted as the first transplants. Now, further information as well as relevant, relevant um, you know, documents relating to this can be actually found um, on the BSB UMTCT. This is actually, this QR code would be taking you to the full list of the transplant centers. That would also give you the information about whether you're having only autographs or auto and allographs, or whether you're having both adult and pediatric. So please do look at that. But we are specifically focusing on only the transfusion support that is actually provided for these transplants. Now, what are the challenges and what are the things that we need to talk about? Whether it is an autograft or whether it is an allo allogenic stem cell transplant, we need to remember that they would be having the specific requirements. And all of you would be aware about the irradiation requirements that would be needed for these patients. And we would be going through this a bit more in detail. Equally, the additional challenge that we have with allogenic stem cell transplant is you know, about 40 to 50% of them are ABO mismatched. And this data is actually coming from the EBNT, that is European Bone Marrow Transplant uh, Registry Handbook. Now, what then happens is the allogeneic patients would change the blood group requirements for the transfusion during the different stages of the trans, uh, transplant. And while the decision, you know, while the ABO, the transplantation across the ABO barrier is possible, what we really need to remember and take into consideration is the potential immunohematological problems. They need to be taken into account and before we make the transfusion decisions. 
Now, also, if you look at how much of the transfusions are actually covered for the um, transplant patients, that is quite a bit. So red cells in the platelets, especially in the peritrans um, transplant period, there is a high requirement for these transfusions. Now, we will also cover, yes, they can also get granulocytes and other blood components as well. So we need to be actually aware of what are the special requirements for these patients. And like with anywhere where you know, uh, the transfusions are given, we have uh, potential for errors as well as reactions. And indeed, that is where SHOT comes into the picture. So we are the UK hemovigilance scheme. And as you all know, we work collaboratively with the MHRA. And just to remind everybody whether the transfusions are happening in a transplant setting or in a non-transplant setting any reactions or errors, you know, um, would be actually reportable to SHORT. And that, uh, you know, all of you would be familiar and we are funded by the four UK blood services. What are the reporting categories? There is a definitions document, um, of which, uh, you know, again, scanning this QR code will be taking, to, uh, taking you to the latest um, definitions document and the categories under which they, they are reportable. And these are aligned with the international guidelines. So we have International Society of um, Blood Transfusion Guidelines, and these we review it on an annual basis. So to give a, um, a you know idea about how many transfusions happen in the UK, and this is not just in transplants, we have close to 2.1 million blood components um, that were issued by the four UK blood services in 2020. And this is not taking into consideration the new component that was um, uh, developed, that was the COVID-19 convalescent plasma. Now, we keep talking about errors and reactions. It is important to remember that largely the transfusions in the UK are safe, and that is actually depicted. This is for illustrative purposes only, this big circle. And the risk of the death and serious harm are as illustrated here. Um, so what we are really looking at is how can we make things safer? How can we make the components safer? How can we make our processes safer for the patients? So there are, um, unfortunately, some deaths that are reported year on year related to transfusions. Now, there is a term that we refer to as imputability, which is actually causality. How much did the transfusions contribute? So there are you know, different, uh, different categories, so whether it is um, possible, probable, and definite. This number that we have actually depicted here um, uh, shows all degrees of imputability, and there were 39 deaths reported in 2020. Now, this is for all transfusions, it is not just in the transplant setting. But I wanted to actually highlight here that it is important that we look at all of these because these can also play, you know, can occur even in our transplant patients as well. So always the question is, you know, what, how, what are the preventable harm as well and what can we proactively do to actually make things safer? And the other important thing to remember is of all the short reports that we actually get, more than 80% of them serially over the last few years have been actually related to errors. And these errors, you know, are, uh, you know, can be clinical laboratory combination of the errors. Sometimes with, you know, despite errors, there may be no um, patient impact because the right component has ultimately been transfused appropriately to the right patient, or they could be picked up as near misses. However, you know, some, some of the errors can also actually potentially result in the death of the patient. And that is why we need to really look at, you know, how, what are our weak points in the system and how do we actually improve this? At this point, I'll hand you over to Jenny to actually present the next part of the presentation. Over to you, Jenny. Thank you, Shruti. So if you can move the slide on, that would be great. Thank you. So we know that transfusion is a complex multi-step process, and this is depicted really nicely in this 10-step diagram, which is in the 2020 SHOT report. And there are lots of people involved in the transfusion process, lots of different staff groups, from the medic making the decision to transfuse and gaining consent through the blood ordering and sample taking processes, and then going through all the processes and steps in the laboratory the collection and administration of the component and the monitoring of the patient for reactions as well. And because this is a complex process, there are opportunities for error at every step. And this is just the standard transfusion process. If you then add in the complexity of managing transplant patients as well, often with shared care between different organizations, it's easy to see how things can go wrong. And when dealing with blood transfusions, we're very aware of the ABO compatibility rules when we're selecting our blood components. And when selecting stem cell products for transplant, the main driver is HLA compatibility, not ABO. 
And so the transplants are not always ABO compatible, as Shruti mentioned earlier. And this table shows the complexity of the compatibility or incompatibility of the transplants. The transplant donor blood groups are across the top of the table and the recipient down the left hand side. And I'm not going to go through the table in detail, but it's just to demonstrate that ABO differences between the stem cell donor and the recipient can then cause complications for blood component selection down the line. And in this table, you can see that some stem cell transplants are ABO compatible, so they're the easy ones. And then you have major ABO incompatibility. And this is where the presence of anti-A or B in the recipient's plasma is incompatible with the donor red cells. For example, with the group A donor and the group O recipient. And this accounts for about 20 to 25% of transplants. Then you have the minor ABO incompatibility where anti-A or B in the donor's plasma is reactive to the recipient red cells. So for example, a group O donor and a group A recipient. And this again is about 20 to 25% of transplants. And then the bidirectional incompatibility where both the donor and the recipient plasma have the antibodies that are reactive with the donor and recipient red cells. So for example, a group A donor and a group B recipient. And this accounts for about 5% of transplants. So what impact does ABO mismatch transplant have for the patient? Well, there's a risk that ABO incompatibility between the donor and the recipient can cause hemolytic transfusion reactions. And de delayed hemolysis can occur in minor ABO mismatch transplants. And this is due to hemolysis of remaining recipient red cells by antibodies produced by donor B lymphocytes. Major or bidirectional ABO incompatible transplants can cause pure red cell aplasia. They can cause delayed engraftment and they can result in increased red cell transfusion requirement. And the risk is, is higher if a group O recipient with high TETA anti-A receives a group A transplant. And there's a really good article by Nina Worrell if you wanted to read more about this and the link is shown at the bottom of this slide here. So this table, which is a very busy slide, I'm afraid, but this is based on the EBMT handbook and it shows the complexity of the decision making processes in the laboratory for selecting different component types for transplant patients. And just the sheer scale of the table shows you how difficult this process is. There are different decisions for red cells and plasma products, as you would expect, shown on the table. And then decisions based on whether there has been a major, minor or bidirectional ABO incompatibility. And you can see on the table that decisions are also based on the phase of the transplant. So phase one is um, pre-transplant. So at that point, it's recipient group or compatible blood components. Phase two is immediately after the transplant until full engraftment of the donor cells. So with ABO incompatible transplants, at this point, there may be a mix of donor and recipient red cells, plus any red cell transfusions that, that might have been given. And phase three is post engraftment. And sadly, the graft may be rejected in some patients. And if this happens, the blood components then need to be compatible with both the donor and the recipient blood group until the recipient blood group has reverted back. Graft manipulation is sometimes needed to optimize the volume and the cellular composition of stem cell products. And this includes apheresis, bone marrow and cord bloods. And this is done in discussion with the transplant center. So it may be different in different centers. But um, basic manipulations will comprise of centrifugation procedures, which reduce the amount of red cells in the product and also the volume of the product. And depletion of red cells may be necessary in the case of blood group incompatibilities. And it's usually confined to bone marrow products. And also washing might be necessary to remove unwanted antibodies. And we need to take the RHD antigen matching into account as well, as the transplant may be mismatched. And again, we have major and minor incompatibility as shown in point two here. 
and occasionally delayed hemolysis is seen if the donor has anti-D and the recipient is D positive. And the BSH recommend that if either the recipient or the donor is D negative, then D negative red cells should be selected for transfusion to, present, to prevent immunization. There may also be a need to consider other red cell antigens and antibodies. So if the recipient has a clinically significant antibody, then the donor should be phenotyped and the transplant product may need to be red cell depleted. And there have been cases of immune hemolysis following stem cell plant transplant because of red cell antibodies. And in particular, these involve the KID, MNS and KEL blood group systems. So we've talked about the ABO and the D requirements for selecting compatible blood components, but transplant patients have other transfusion specific requirements as well, as Shruti mentioned earlier, and this is most notably irradiated and CMV negative. And the need for irradiated comp components is complex again, but basically all recipients of stem cell transplants need irradiated components before and after the transplant. And the complexity there comes in around how long before the transplant you need irradiated. And this is dependent on whether the transplant is an allogeneic or an autologous one. And also how long afterwards you need to keep using irradiated components. And that's dependent also on patient factors. So if your patient has Hodgkin's lymphoma or they've been treated with purine analogues, then you'll need to give irradiated components indefinitely. And you can look at the full description of irradiated requirements in the BSH guidelines, as the link on the slide says. Uh, in terms of CMV negative, the component requirement is slightly easier. So all patients where stem cell transplant is planned should have a baseline CMV test. But CMV negative components are not required to be supplied if the recipient is CMV negative, as the standard leukodepletion of the components is con considered to suffice. But the important exception to this rule is for granulocyte components, because granulocytes cannot be leukodepleted. And so if the recipient is CMV negative, then the granulocyte should be CMV negative as well. And there's further guidance on this in the NHSBT and SHOT links, which are provided on this slide. So we've seen how complex this whole process is and inevitably errors occur. And over the next few slides, we'll look at the types and trends of errors reported to SHOT involving stem cell transplant patients. We reviewed all the SHOT reports that involved transplant patients from 2011 to 2020. And in this time period, there were over 400 errors, and these are including the near miss events. And the vast majority of the errors involved transfusion of ABO and or D mismatched blood components and the failure to supply irradiated components. And these errors occurred both in the clinical and the laboratory setting. And this is hardly surprising. We've just discussed how complex the process is and the decision making in this group of patients. So in this slide, we've pulled out of the errors included in the 2020 report. And this is a similar theme to that reported in previous years. And most often we see failure to provide irradiated or mismatched components. And these errors are due to failures in communication from the clinical to the laboratory teams. And this means that laboratory computer systems or LIMS aren't updated with the flags and alerts that support laboratory staff decision making. But we also see failures within the laboratory where the flags are not being added to the LIMS in a timely manner, so there is no decision support to help them, and lab staff bypassing the flags or alerts. And this is possibly because the alerts are too easy to bypass, or they may not be helpful or relevant. And there may also be an element of alert fatigue if there are too many alerts in the system. And when patients have received ABO incompatible stem cell transplants, labs should not use electronic issue to release compatible red cells. And I haven't covered that in detail in previous slides, but it is included in the shot reporting. And in the 2020 report, inappropriate use of electronic issue actually accounted for 27% of errors. And again, this may occur because the lab are not informed that the patient has received a transplant or that limbs are not set up to exclude these patients from electronic issue processes. 
So this slide just shows the categories of reporting over these years from 2011 to 2020. And I'm not going to dwell on this slide too much, but it just demonstrates that there are similar trends year on year. So failure to meet specific requirements is mainly a result of communication failures, as I said. Uh, between the clinical and the laboratory teams and obviously this is further compounded by share where the shared care of the patients between the transplant center and local hospitals and you really need a robust process for making sure that the lab are aware of the transplant at the earliest opportunity and not waiting until transfusion is required because once the lab know about the transplant they can set up the flags and alerts in their limbs and then the chances for error are markedly reduced Most of the errors with transfusion of ABO and or D mismatch components occur in the laboratory. And these are often caused by inappropriate use of the limbs, failure to update the limbs with alerts and warnings or notices, or failure to heed the warnings in the limbs. And some limbs may not have algorithms that actually support the decision-making process for transplant patients, but are reliant on staff looking at the advice that's only available on notes in the system. And it's been recognized in the near miss reporting that these errors are often picked up by the clinical team pre-transfusion. And this is where clinical teams are using the transplant protocols provided by the transplant center. And these have the blood group compatibility requirements on them and the clinical staff have then been able to use these to notice that there's been a lab error. So no deaths have been reported due to transfusion errors in transplant patients in the shot data, but errors have occasionally resulted in delays in stem cell harvesting if the specific requirements haven't been met. And there have been some reports of minor side effects, such as hemolysis following ABO mismatched and patients with red cell antibodies. In terms of near misreporting, in this period between 2011 and 2020, there were 133 events with 29 of these in pediatric patients. And the trends in the near misreporting reflect those in actual events, so they're mainly failure to provide irradiated and the ABOD mismatch components. And it's so important to look at these events and investigate them as well. They're a free learning opportunity because they reveal problems within the system with no actual patient harm. And they're also a really good opportunity look, to look at what went right or what happened that prevented the error and any learning from that that can be used to improve the system as well. So thank you. I'm going to hand over to Paula now. Thanks very much, Jenny. And I, it's, it's very interesting. When we started collecting and pulling this data out in uh, 10 years ago, we were very surprised to find that there were so many issues with transplantation because we assumed that every hospital that was transplanting very carefully produced a timetable of exactly what happened when, but clearly it wasn't working. And uh, so you can see here, poor communication is a major issue and there are several contributory factors to that. Poor staffing, poorly designed systems, a lack of resources and poor, maybe poor IT um, equipment, complicated processes, there's certainly that, and SOPs that are difficult to follow, and maybe you can't find where it is. Next, please. So in human factors terms, uh, this dirty dozen, they call them, come, I think, from the airline industry, showing all the different uh, personal factors, if you like, that can contribute to making mistakes. I won't go through them in detail, but you can see that they're things that are common to our hospital practice, distraction particularly, lack of resources, fatigue, stress, lack of awareness, and so on. Next. So when we think about the common themes, these come up again and again, issues with the limbs, the lack of adequate training, and then of course assumptions, particularly also incomplete checks and distractions. People make assumptions about which patient it is or what product, and then they do the wrong thing. Next. So common themes um, cover, covers many things that, that uh, Jenny has already, already discussed, and I don't really want to go through those again, but it's absolutely critical that you do deal with one patient at a time and don't leave out the final bedside check, because as has already been mentioned, this is often the time at which an error is picked up at the bedside by careful checking. 
So we're going to have a few illustrated cases now. And here's the first one. Again, failure to communicate. So the patient had an allograft with a group change. The patient's original group was O and the graft donor was A. But the clinical staff didn't tell the transfusion laboratory this transplant was taking place. And I think this is particularly surprising, but we've seen this again and again. The error was incidentally picked up two weeks later, by which time the patient had been transfused three units of OPOS platelets when his requirements were for different groups, A, A, B, or B platelets only. Next. And here's an example of failure to provide irradiated components. So the patient was for a stem cell uh, transplant that had previously been cancelled. The notes had been updated, and then the request form did state that irradiated blood was required and that the patient was pre-transplant, pre but the blood was serologically cross-matched and sent to the ward. But when the ward staff were, note this, checking the unit at the bedside, it was noticed that the unit was not irradiated because the lab had not noticed and acted on that uh, request on the form. Next. So here's an example where the wrong component was transfused to the wrong patient. Three bags of platelets arrived onto the ward together, and this is always a risk when you have several components arriving at the same time. And they were signed in from transport at the nurse's desk. Then one of the platelet units was taken into the transplant unit, and they did all the checks against the unit in the prescription chart and the bag and label, but critical point didn't confirm the identification of the patient before connecting up the transfusion. So this was a, an inappropriate platelet transfusion given to the wrong patient. As soon as the staff realised their mistake, they stopped the transfusion. No harm resulted, fortunately. Next. So this is the four, fourth case. A patient had a stem cell transplant in August. A month later, the patient was in a different hospital and needed transfusion because of a low haemoglobin and platelet count. However, details of the previous transplant were not provided to the laboratory so the patient didn't get irradiated blood components. And this is quite a difficult issue when the patient is in a different hospital to the one where they had the transplant. This patient had an additional requirement for HLA match platelets, which were also not provided due to a lack of information. Next. So this is the, the fifth case. A transplant protocol was received by the laboratory on day minus nine, that's nine days before the transplant. And a flag was set on the limbs on day nine to indicate what the transfusion requirements would be. The patient's blood group was AD negative, but the donor was OD negative. So this patient should have had OD negative red cells to match the donor group. The specific requirements flag was changed according to the protocol. On day plus six, a request for wet red cells was received, but the BMS didn't check the specific requirements correctly and ordered the patient's original group A instead of O. A second BMS performing the cross match failed to check the specific requirements, and so this was missed in the laboratory. So the patient uh, did receive a transfusion without any noticeable reaction. So, how can we improve a safe transfusion for our HSCT patients? So, here are some factors that we, can, we should consider. Communication, as I've mentioned, is absolutely key, and there needs to be continuous two-way communication between the clinical area and the laboratory area, particularly as the blood group of the patient will be evolving through the allogeneic transplant. We need clear protocols and procedures. The pre-administration checks must be done properly, as I've already just illustrated from what I've said. Not just the, um, the, the identity check, but also the TACO checklist because these patients are often, have often been very unwell and are at increased risk. We need to look at our SOPs and procedures and make them more simple. All, patient, all the staff involved with transplants need to have adequate knowledge and certainly adequate transfusion competency assessment. So there's a major role for the transfusion laboratory. It's the problem with some of the management systems is that you can't put enough flags on them to show what's needed for a particular patient going through transplant. But this is why there needs to be continuous communication with the laboratory staff talking to the clinical staff to make sure that there's relevant and accessible information in the laboratory and the laboratory steps are properly checked 
to detect errors. The other important person, of course, is the patient, and the patient can be educated or informed and encouraged, indeed, to participate in the decision making and to know their specific transfusion requirements. That's often how errors are picked up when the patient goes to another hospital, when they know what they should be receiving, even when the information hasn't been passed. Next. So we've got several uh, useful resources from SHOT relating to transplants. There's quite a, a detailed document that you can see there that you can um, obtain by, I presume, by scanning the, the QR code, which is, is very helpful. It gives you more detailed information. Next. And uh, we have also done an educational video about transfusion errors in transplant recipients. And you can scan all these safe transfusion checklists, TACO, etc., under current resources on the SHOT website. Next. And then there's this really helpful um, app that you can get, which helps in transfusion decision making in general. I think this is really marvellous. It, it uh, solves the problem for a lot of um, medical and nursing staff to have a quick look up of what the essential thing is to, to be done. So get it right first time every time. Make sure you've completed the checklist before starting the blood transfusion. And now I will hand over to Shruti. Thanks, Paula. And I think um, we have, um, you know, gone through what are all the challenges in the transfusions and transplant recipients, and also highlighting what are all the weak points that are evident through the reports that have been submitted to SHORT. And over the next few minutes, um, you know, we come back to one of the other passionate topics for SHORT is actually addressing the human factors. Now, this is not just transplant specific, but I think it is important for us to actually highlight when we are talking about improving systems and improving communications. And these human factor principles are actually, a, you know, throughout the transfusion chain, whether we are at the donor end, whether we are in a blood service with the manufacturing and processing and testing, or whether we are at the patient end. And um, the human factors, when we talk about it, it is not just at the other end of investigating incidents, but we are talking about when you're designing the policies and the processes, it is always better if you actually follow simple process, if you put in simple processes in place so that it is easier to follow and more difficult to deviate. So then you're actually, that is a recipe for um, a better safety. So apply these principles to actually design processes, to have simple work instructions, to also you know, ensure that everybody is actually, you have a good safety culture, you have a questioning culture, you're having everybody work together as a team, and um, obviously also investigating and learning from when things go wrong. Now, we have been highlighting the importance of applying a human factors based investigative framework for the last several years. And um, it's also important to actually go, said, look at the whole systems and apply the systems thinking principles as well. Now, we have worked with the patient safety team at the NHS EI, and um, we have used um, the SEEPS framework, which is actually applying the similar principles. So this is the systems engineering initiative for patient safety. So this is worked, um, uh, we have used a ABO incompatible case and work through so you can find that in the supplementary material and just shows to actually highlight that not all the incidents are actually linear while root cause analysis is actually a good um, way of investigating incidents you may have to actually look at the whole process end to end to address more complex issues that are there and it's also important for the last couple of the short reports we have been actually saying that okay rather than just being reactive we need to actually move to a proactive way of looking at safety so we are actually looking at a synergy of both the safety one as well as the safety two approaches and what we are saying is we're all very familiar with safety one so you know what we are doing when things go wrong and then in investigate you know what are the factors that are actually uh, contributing to this mainly the systemic factors and then you're putting things right in place but then we are also actually looking at most of the times, you know, as we've also shown in the transfusions, most of the times things go right. So therefore, how are we actually then, what is the learning that is possible? You know, because we are adapting every day, we are actually, you know, what, what is it about a situation that actually results in an error? So you are still looking at, you know, when things go wrong, but you're asking a different set of questions. You're using principles of appreciative inquiry. You're actually ensuring that you're also learning from excellence and you're having a very proactive way to, um, to the safety too.
you're having the regular debriefs with the staff and everybody is engaged in that learning. So what we would encourage is apply the safety one and the safety two principles. We also actually encourage that learning from excellence and we have introduced the short ACE category that is acknowledging continuing excellence in transfusion. And this is an example, and this is already there in our short report as well, where the, you know, when you're faced with the challenges, how did you actually come up with this innovative solution, go above and beyond, and also do things well to ensure that the safety is not compromised. And you can actually see the details of this in our safety notice. It's also important, you know, when you're talking about, you know, the implementing the safety, involving the patients and how can we actually get their experiences. So I'm not going to read through this, but Charlotte Silva is actually one of our patient representatives who is on our short steering group. And this highlights the importance. What Paula was actually mentioning before is involving the patients and also having a good team safety culture that is palpable whenever patients are actually coming in. So you have that whole practice of engaged staff and also having that questioning culture that you're there and learning from every experience. So what we are really saying is for every healthcare system, so even for your transplant practice, you're just not learning only from when things go wrong, but also from when things are you know, positive as well. And therefore, you know, this, I keep um, you know, emphasizing these things. So we need to actually learn from our near misses. We need to learn from excellence. We need to learn from every error that is actually happening and applying from these uh, human factors and the systems thinking principles. So I'll leave you with these three you know, recommendations that we have. So one was about addressing delays about having IT systems vein to vein to actually improve the safety and that is applicable even for the um, a transplant and how the importance of effective investigations um, you know, to help improve the systems. We also, you know, as I keep hopping on about looking at the whole system, again, emphasizing that we need adequate staffing and the resources. We need to design the user-centered processes so that you're having clear SOPs and simple to follow SOPs. And we also need to remember that whenever you're having the education and training of the staff, it is also important for the staff to understand the why. So we've often seen when there are missed um, irradiation as well as where the specific requirements are not met, it is either due to lack of, you know, the com people will be thinking this is too complex to remember, but the basic principle is why do you need it? And are you having that fundamental question anytime that you're requesting a transfusion, does this patient need any specific requirement? So having that also the team-based learning, team-based approach to that is also very important. We've already spoken about investigating incidents. It's also having a just culture and making sure that you're optimizing the learning and having that psychological safety within the teams and also sharing the lessons learned. So we've been through what are all the systemic changes that are actually needed. So just re reiterating what are the principles that we are saying you know, uh, following the um, errors that have been reported for the transfusions in transplants. First and foremost, there has to be clear, accurate, timely communication between all the teams. It is within the clinical teams, between clinical and laboratory teams, and everybody involved in the patient care. So it may be actually from the referral hospital as well as the transplant um, center as well. Also, all, patient, all staff who are dealing with the HSCT patients um, must be familiar with their transfusion requirements, must be also aware of the uh, knowledge and the skills that are necessary for the safe transfusions, as well as should be able to actually access and be able to know where to access the relevant policies as well as the documents. And the documents themselves should be easy, simple to follow, and the protocol, the transplant protocol should be actually having the patient's transfusion requirements, and that should be available and easily accessible to the staff. Again, as Paula mentioned, staff need to be actually vigilant and carry out the pre-administration checks for the transfusions. And many neomesses have been actually picked up by vigilant staff. Also, the other points that we want to highlight is it's important that the LIM system is updated. It contains the relevant and accessible information and that all laboratory steps are properly checked so that the errors can be detected before they can result in wrong transfusion. And always important to actually keep our patients informed and educated as well. So patient informed uh, in, uh, involvement in decision making should be encouraged. And so my ask to you today is actually to go back whether you know in, whether it is in a hospital or in a, I mean in a transplant center or in a non-transplant center. It is important to go back and reflect on your own processes and actually see do we have the systems in place to actually ensure for all these steps that we have addressed. 
So that comes to the end of the presentation, but as we are here, you know, we may, we are presenting on behalf of the whole team and this work is actually uh, only possible because of the reports that are submitted to SHORT. So we are very thankful for that. Also the SHORT office team is very well supported by the SHORT steering group and the working expert group members. And we are very thankful for our MHRA hemovigilance team as well. So all the acknowledgements are actually there and I'll stop sharing and we can now open for further discussions. Hi, thank you. Um, really fascinating presentations from everybody there. So um, we're going to go to the questions and answers section where we can ask the panel any questions that you have. Um, so do feel free to put any in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. Uh, there are a few there already, so I'll start with the first one. Um, so how do we address issues with communication to ensure safe transfusions in transplant recipients? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's very easy for us to actually say, okay, communication is important. I think that is a valid question about how do we address these communication issues. And it comes from, uh, you know, uh, the principles would be they have to be timely and you are not relying on just a phone call. You have to actually follow it up with the, um, the written instructions and they should be clear instructions and they should be timely. But also important is to identify the key stakeholders in the patient care, because often what we say is, you know, we are not intentionally leading out it may be lack of awareness of who all need to be informed so i think i would suggest that you know whenever you're actually having you know either the patient being referred to a transplant center or sitting at a transplant center if you're sending out a discharge summary it is equally important to know who are all the key players in that patient care including the patient and family themselves who need to be informed and often we also see that even the discharge summaries may be actually going at length about you know um, the antibiotics and the other things that were given it's also important to actually the, uh, capture the specific requirements. So I think it is, you know, um, it is identifying who all need to be um, informed and um, keeping it real time, um, you know, clear communication is vital. And if there are any changes to the plans in the transplant, again, that has to be actually communicated to even your laboratory teams. Because, you know, the stem cell lab, you may have had that conversation with the stem cell lab, but if the transfusion laboratory team do not know, then again, the instructions cannot be updated. And taking appropriate actions as a result of the communication, because communication as Paula said, is bi-directional. So you may have that communication. What are the actions specifically that that stakeholder in that care needs to take? So therefore, if the limbs need to be updated as a result of that communication, that needs to happen as a result of that as well. Sorry, a long-winded answer, but there it is. But I don't know if Paula and Jenny also had anything to add. One of the um, useful models, I think, is where a member of the laboratory staff can attend the clinical, uh, what you call a ward round, only it isn't, it's a meeting in an, in an office to discuss all the haematology patients. So if a member of the, of the laboratory staff regularly attends one of those, that individual can transmit messages back to the laboratory about what's coming up in terms of the haematology patients. And that works pretty well. The, one of the big problems is when the patient goes to another hospital and as Shruti said, you can send all the, the documentation to the clinical staff, but what's difficult is the laboratories talking to one another and there have been some data protection issues about whether lab staff can phone between hospitals to update the transfusion laboratory in a language that they will understand rather than going up to the, and across and down again. And I think that actually needs, needs to be addressed. But we learn all that by looking at the instances where it goes wrong. And as I've mentioned, certainly the patient can help by knowing what their requirement is. Yeah, and I think I'll add just from a laboratory perspective, um, getting the information to them, some really fundamental things like don't send the, the paper information to an individual person like the lab manager or the transfusion practitioner send it to a generic or if you're sending it via emails as well send it to a generic email that lots of people can access and then you don't get into those problems if somebody's off sick or on holiday and it doesn't get opened for a few weeks and also for because it's so important to get that information into the limbs really early on look at it and automating those processes if you can can you get your electronic patient records to automatically send those specific requirements or if you're using electronic prescribing can that be used and and harnessed to send the, that information across and I think although IT is generally not a quick fix because you need to put in interfaces, but if you, if you have that as a goal, even if you can't do it quickly, it's something for future proofing it and don't, don't give up too easily on trying to get that to work. 
Okay, thanks for that. Absolutely. There's a there's quite a few questions coming in, Nikki, isn't there now? With um, and it's quite a few similar questions about electronic issue and uh, why we don't um, use electronic issue for blood following uh, these transplants. If someone would like to answer that, please. Uh, so electronic issue in the BSH guidelines, it says for compatibility testing that an IAT cross match should be used for ABO incompatible stem cell transplants. And I expect that um, when you've got the ABO incompatibility, the when you're doing your testing in the laboratory, you'll have to do some sort of manual intervention on the results because you'll get anomalous results. So that should probably exclude it from electronic issue. But there may be occasions where um, the, the sample doesn't get itself excluded and then flags and alerts need to be put in the limbs to make sure that you can not do electronic issue on those samples. It is a bit difficult in the labs. Okay. Yeah, hence the That's... shot reports. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Nikki, you've got any more questions there? Yeah, there's a couple of questions and I suppose they're, they're, they're part of the same question really. So the first one was, when does engraftment take place? When would you consider that it, it had um, taken place? And, and the flip side to that is, when would you class the engraftment failure, I suppose, look from a lab perspective? Yeah, I can um, begin by answering that. I think engraftment, when we are taking, uh, telling, uh, I mean, before a transplant, you're giving conditioning, which can be chemotherapy, radiotherapy, monoclonal antibodies, and you're actually, uh, they can be to a different degree myelotoxic. So engraftment is once you have given these stem cells, whatever form they are, whether they are from a bone marrow or peripheral stem cells or cord, then how long do you start seeing, you know, before you start seeing recovery of the uh, blood cells, the differentiated blood cells. So this is, uh, you know, given the complexity of the transplant, is variable. It depends on several factors, depending on the type of conditioning and uh, the type of transplant that is being used, as well as the source. In general, you're actually seeing, uh, you can see it from as early as the second week. Neutrophil engraftment is actually earlier than the uh, platelet uh, engraftment, as well as the red cell engraftment. And um, peripheral blood stem cells, there is actually a faster rate of engraftment. So these are general principles. And in the, you know, you can have from two to four weeks as well that the engraftment can take place. But in the definition for an engraftment failure is when you don't have any evidence of recovery a month after your stem cell infusion. Now, um, there, there may be also, you know, you may have an initial sign of a recovery and then failing, you know, where, the blood, uh, where you're losing the graft and that is actually a, um, a secondary graft failure, whereas the primary uh, engraftment failure is actually where you don't have any evidence of a, um, a, a, you know, rise in the blood cells at all. So I think I would suggest that, uh, you know, the transplanters, we don't have any transplanters here, but they can actually give, uh, you know, more specific answer, but these are the general principles that would be guiding it. So as you can actually see, because of the differential rate, your requirement for the blood components also would be varying. Again, what we have not um, covered here is the threshold for the transfusion for the different components. Again, they would be actually dependent on several um, factors there as well. So that is, uh, you know, the general principles for engraftment. Okay, thanks for that, Shruti. Um, I'll read this next question out from Aaron Deep Gill. It says, how do we approach guidelines on issuing versus um, HCHST guidelines. We have had a positive, an A positive male patient with an O negative donor. They were given A positive platelets instead of an A negative by a member of staff trying to use an expiring unit. Could guidelines be clearer or can more be done to, with overlap of the guidelines? Somebody wants to answer that question. I would Good say question. yes, um, uh, yeah, I think, the uh, you know guidelines each I would say follow your local transfusion policies as well. So ultimately, it is also that um, they should you don't you want to prevent any transfusion delays. It depends on the urgency of the transfusion indication. Okay, that is the first point that I would like to make. And second, we're not dealing with specific individual uh, you know. Um, uh, mix of the blood groups here, please do go to the guideline links that we have actually given. The recording of this webinar is also available and we will put in some useful links. But I think when we are doing these transfusion policies, it is ultimately coming down to that communication. You need to be able to liaise with your clinical team. What is the urgency? How soon do you need? And how long it is going to be taking for you to be giving that optimal component? Now, we need to remember that um, in the, you know, we have already spoken about the Dean negative components. I don't know, Jenny may also want to come in, but basically what we really want is to reduce the alloimmunization 
conversation as well. And especially if you are having, you know, reduced intensity transplants that are happening and you're having in the, um, uh, you know, in the people in the childbearing age group, what you really don't want is any preventable instance of an alloy immunization as well. And therefore you really are, you know, that's the um, BSH guideline saying that if you're having a donor or a recipient who is actually D negative, ideally you need to be giving D negative components. I don't know, Jenny, did you have anything more to add to that? Oh, it's just really complicated, isn't it? And lots of competing priorities. You don't want to waste components, but you've also, and then you've got a patient with two, looks like they've got two blood groups. It is, it's very complex and it's good to have really clear guidance in your local policies and your SOPs as well in the lab to make sure that whoever's out there on the shop floor issuing the components is very clear in what they're doing and they've got all of that information at their fingertips. Yeah, and the next question, um, it says there is a wide variation between regions sharing regarding shared care documentation. Absolutely. Um, will there be any consideration to a standardised format for this nationally, which may help improve the process? That would be my ideal solution so that we are ideal. able yeah, to actually then standardize our practices and reduce the variation. Yeah. So it does not matter whether a patient is actually coming from a place A or a B, wherever they go, they're actually assured. I think what we are doing is beginning this dialogue so that we can actually standardize this practice. It has to be a multi-pronged approach. And we, we, you know, whether we have some standard templates that people could be actually then adopting so that we say, these are the minimum requirements for that shared care. I know with many of the integrated care and pathology networks, there are already things that are being worked out in place so um, you know and if you have some excellent examples please do share so I think these are only through these forums that we can actually say this is actually uh, one of the best templates we have seen so I think we are coming from a hemovigilance perspective we are not saying that we know the solution for everything but we are here to facilitate the, and promote good solutions for improving transfusion safety. Is, there, is that something that could be discussed at the National Blood Transfusion Committee do you think? Potentially, I think that would be a good place because we would then have even the PBM, uh, the patient blood management teams as well, and transfusion practitioners and the laboratory managers who can then liaise with their local teams as well. So I think, yeah, we can take an action on ourselves that we can discuss it with our um, uh, National Blood Transfusion Committee and the other, you know, in, in both England as well as the other devolved countries as well. Yeah, as, as a lab manager, having a standardised system would be would be ideal wouldn't it then it regardless of where they came from or where they were going to everything was the same yeah um, okay so, oh sorry nikki no i was just gonna say time all right so we've got a comment from Reka anand hello Reka. Um, there are a number of occasions where it's not easy to choose components in these patients and she's and Reka says she's always had a discussion in the lab and with the clinicians in the hospital and go through the risks and benefits i think that just reiterates what we've said in the presentation so thanks for that Reka. Um, the next question we've got is um, from nicole whelan and she said it was mentioned that cmv negative was not required for red cells and platelets anymore just for granulocyte. Uh, the question is just for granulocytes. Yeah, so um, SAPTO um, a group had actually looked at uh, the CMB specification for the blood components. I've just posted the link in the uh, in, a, in response to the uh -huh. Q&A. Also, if you look at our safe transfusion for transplant document also would be clarifying this. So just as a background, universal leukodepletion was actually implemented by all the four UK blood services in 1999. And this was primarily as a um, variant CGD risk reduction measure. And, um, you know, there are specifications for the leukodepletion as well. And what we then see is when you're able to leukodeplete the CMV, which is actually an intracellular, the risk is also coming down with the leukodepleted components. So there was a, a robust risk assessment that was actually done. And therefore, you know, the local practices may vary. Some of the, I know of some of the centers where they would be saying if the recipient is CMV negative, we still need, but this is actually the guidance out there. However, what we are trying to, you know, what, what we really need to identify is, you know, not all the components. You have white cell components, you have buffy coats, you have granulocytes, and, you know, they are white cells. So for that, you need to remember that they are, you know, there is a higher risk of the CMV if you are actually giving them CMV unscreened or CMV positive components. So therefore, what you really want is, you know, in elective transfusions, you're actually giving the best component that is possible and the safest component that is possible. So you are actually then saying in, a, you know, the granulocytes, they have to be CMV negative and that is the guidance that we had actually seen. So both from the shot, the documents, as well as there is also um, guide, guidance that has actually gone out from the, um, uh, uh, the um, PBM team from the NHSPT as well and the links that Jenny had shown. 
See, there's a, there's a comment from Kelly that says we need a national spine like spice for all info on these patients where we could all look all in one place. I, yeah, I mean, ideal again, wouldn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. But also, I think I would also add to that uh, uh, is, Nikki, um, that not just having it, but also that uh, interoperability and accessibility, because it may be there, but if that does not speak to your system or it is actually reliant on somebody having to for every occasion, we need more staff, we need to have good IT systems, so we need optimal resources to ensure all of this. Yeah, it would be ideal, wouldn't it, to link straight into your limbs will be... Um... Yeah, so the, the next question is from Ria. It says, is there any benefit to performing A or B teeters when engraftment appears to be complete? Oh, I don't know. I think, um, uh, Jenny, do you know the answer to the... Uh... No, sorry, I don't know. don't know the answer to that one. Because I, uh, I, I'm, I must say, I don't know the answer to that. Um, because generally, when you're saying the chimera, I mean, it depends on whether you're having 100% donor engraftment as well, isn't it? So um, instead of giving you an, any, uh, any mishmash of an answer, I would say I don't know the correct answer for that one. Okay, shall I ask another one? Okay, um, what blood components are most commonly used? I'm assuming during during the process, we've got red blood cells, platelets, white cells. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah I mean, ma mainly, mainly red cells and platelets and occasionally granulocytes uh, are used, but not that often. OK, that's great. Um, we've got one statement and another question. So uh, from Paul said, should patients carry a card issued for them? Uh, for their transfusion requirements and Claire Michelle Neville pointed that out that the patient should carry the a card for their transfusion requirements so thanks for those comments uh, and oh sorry truth uh, Paula I would I was just going to say that in the past patients were supposed to have cards if they had irregular antibodies but it doesn't work because the patients don't have them or they've forgotten them or they're on the floor or and the nursing staff don't look at them and may not understand them so it's a great idea but it doesn't work yeah okay I think, thanks, Nikki. Yeah, I was just going to say it's only three minutes to go. So um, how time flies when we're having fun. Um, I'll have a little look. Um, the, the last little question is, is paediatric transplant, is CMV neg blood components a require, always a requirement? Um, again, the CMV guidelines are actually there. I would point to that and also look at your local transfusion policies and discussion with the transplant would be actually the best one. Yeah. Super. So shall I draw everything to a close? And as we've got just a couple of minutes left. Um, so I just want to say thank you to everybody for taking part. Um, I Nikki, to... I think we just have a poll. Yeah. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. We do we have a quick poll. So uh, I think it's going to come on your screen now. So thank you, really appreciate it if you take just a couple of minutes to complete this poll. Very simple questions on how many of you are viewing the webinar, um, how, it, how useful you found this session. What's your staff group? Whether you've downloaded the SHOT app or not? How useful do you find the SHOT bytes? And how do you use the SHOT videos? And we're not going to show the results of the poll on the screen here, but it is very useful to us in planning these webinars and also in, in looking at our SHOT resources as well. So thank you, I'll leave that up on the screen for a few minutes. So why everybody's answering that? Shall I shall I um, carry on chatting? So yes, I was going to say thank you everybody and thank you for taking part in the uh, question and answers. Thanks for taking part in the poll. It does really help us target our resources. Don't forget you can download download the Shot app, um, and you can also view all our Shot bites on the main Shot website, and along with other previous webinars are all available for you. Um, we do regularly update all of our resources on the website, so please feel free to use them wherever you might need them in your transfusion education. This, this session is recorded as well, and that will go onto the website, so this will be viewable as well in, in the next um, few weeks. Uh, please do get in touch with us as well at, um, our, via email if you've got any ideas or anything you'd like to see that SHOT get involved with. And do feel free to check out our Twitter page at SHOTHV1. Um, and thank you to everybody for taking part, all the reporters that put all your reports in and everybody for presenting today. Um, and hopefully we look forward to seeing you in the maybe six to eight weeks time for our next uh, next webinar. 
So thank you from Shot. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, thank everyone. you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.